the sermon series is Wisdom and Grace. And this morning we are talking about wisdom in relationships. So how does that tie in to God's holiness, his awesomeness that we just sung about? Well, we serve a God who is love, right? God is love. But we also serve a God who is relationship. Not just in relationship, we serve a God who is relationship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At the root, God is relationship. So weeks back, months back now, this past spring, I preached on this very campus, I preached a sermon about love. And for some of you, some of you were here and you were taking rabid notes and I asked the question, what's the opposite of love? And the common answer is what? Hate, okay. But does anyone remember what I was so bold to proclaim that the opposite of love was? Wow, oh. Greg Dane, I heard that baritone bass voice, you get a gold star. The opposite of love is not hate, but selfishness. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're actually going to read from one of the books of wisdom, the book of Proverbs, we're going to read about what God hates. <laughs> and it's like, and I wanted to remind us of that sermon back this past spring that God can and should hate things that do not contradict with him being a God of love because the opposite of love is not hate, the opposite of love is selfishness. And so with that in mind, I want you to prepare your mind for what you're about to read about what God hates and especially what God hates in relationships. So we're gonna read from the book of Proverbs, one of the most famous books of wisdom. Uh, lots of people that aren't even in church on Sunday, that don't even believe that Jesus is the Son of God, a lot of people pull wisdom from the book of Proverbs. So we're gonna read Proverbs chapter six, and we're just gonna read four verses this morning uh, for our base text, and we're gonna start with verse 16. The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, a lying, a lying witness who gives false testimony, and one who stirs up trouble among brothers. Now, when I think of a relationship, how I would personally define a relationship is this. A relationship is two people constantly asking each other about what they want to eat until one of them dies. That's a relationship to me. And you don't believe me, just watch. You're gonna go out to the parking lot, you're gonna get in the car. Where do you wanna eat? I don't know, where do you want? I feel like this, we had Mexican last week. Let's have, and it's gonna happen tonight, it's gonna to happen tomorrow. To me, that's a very simple definition of relationship, okay? And we could say amen, but then I would be letting the whole worship team down and following up the Revelation song with that. So you can file that away as a, hmm, Michael's right about that, but Here's the thing, because God is a God of relationship, he outlines these seven things that not only pollute relationships, but they destroy relationships. And so that's why he hates them. And specifically, we can just drill down to the foundation and say this, God hates sin. I mean, we can all pretty much agree to that. We don't need a seminary degree to declare God hates sin. Sin, because this passage we just read says God hates, um, these things are detestable to him. Those are strong phrases, right? Hate, detest. And God despises or hates things that are counter to him, that aren't present in his character. So all of these things that we read about, they're not in God. And if they destroy relationships, then he hates them. If you are a father or a mother and you have a wayward son or daughter, 
Maybe they are consumed with drugs. They're consumed with pursuing they're not, concern, they're not consumed with pursuing. They are overcome with addiction. You don't hate your son or daughter. You hate that which consumes them, that which separates them from you, right? So that's why God hates sin. And God has a right to hate sin because not only is it not in him, he's holy, holy, holy. That's what holy, holy, holy means is He's not once without sin. He's not twice without sin. He is repeatedly without sin. He's repeatedly love. But all of these things that he hates, they're the opposite of love. And and these things are the opposite of love because they're all selfish actions. We're going to get into what these seven things are. But I want to caution some of us in the room that say that we love God. In fact, we don't just say it, we display it. We, we come on Sunday, we tithe our income, we volunteer in the community, we even might share what Jesus has done in our lives with our coworkers and our neighbors. I wanna caution us that when we read this list of things that God hates, hit the pause button before you start thinking of other people thinking of other groups. Hit the pause button. Because if Romans chapter 3 is true and that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that there is no one righteous, not one, that means that these sins or the, the elements, the foundations of them, are all in us. And so if we're going to hate these things, we need to hate them first and most fiercely in us. Okay? So that's the disclaimer. <laughs> now let's get to the heart of the matter. And that is that God hates sin, and this kind of sin devastates all relationships. These are sins that when they come from us, it devastates the relationships around us. And that's one of the reasons that God hates it. And And why does God hate sin? Because they steal from the glory we should be giving him. Let me demonstrate. Let's look at these glory-stealing, self-centered actions that not only devastate our relationships, but devastate our relationship between us and God. First, arrogance. Remember, arrogant eyes is what the text said. And some translations say haughty eyes. I don't say haughty. Haughty, and that's not like H-O-T-T-Y, like look at the haughty. No, no, no. That's an old word that basically means prideful, arrogant. It's this sign of a lofty look, arrogant eyes, a lofty look that might be like this or it might be an eye roll. How about that one? No parents have ever gotten a haughty, arrogant eyes from their child, right? It's, it's this look that says, that reveals the pride of the heart, that I know better, that I'm superior. God hates arrogance in us. I have been accused at multiple times in my life of being arrogant, of being a know-it-all, of being, projecting a superior um, attitude. Has anyone else? I have a lot because I was the youngest of six kids. I had four older sisters. I had to tell, if you have four older sisters, obviously someone has to tell them what they're doing wrong, right? Because they're doing it all wrong. Do you, have you ever struggled with thinking highly of yourself? God hates that. He wants you to be humble, but let's not get to what God wants. Let's just stick with what he hates for now. We don't want spoilers. Second, God hates the deceitful. Remember a lying tongue? That's deceitful. That's someone that has no regard for the truth. Or worse yet, they're deceitful because they're trying to angle to to have situations of life come out in a way that's best for them. 
So when you're deceitful, when you lie, it's typically for two reasons. One, it's because you want to self-protect. Who broke this? Uh, she did. I had four sisters. She, she did. No, no, she did. No, no, I meant her. <laughs> she has an alibi. Oh, I meant her. God hates the deceitful, the deceptive. Thirdly, God hates the violent. I think this is pretty obvious. And before you sit there saying, well, I'm not, I don't have hands that shed innocent blood, and we're not talking about, you know, hunting here. We're talking about humans. By the way, I still have a car with a hanging bumper from the innocent blood I shed hitting the deer back, going back to my house. So if I have any body, body mechanics, no? All right. Well, I had to try. Um, this is not just hands that shed innocent blood. This is for probably less women in the room and more men in the room. This is a violent personality or temper. That's where violence, the, the shedding of innocent blood, comes from. You don't skip down the street singing to yourself the theme from the Smurfs, la, 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 roar, and wail on somebody, right? It comes from somewhere, and that somewhere is a lack of self-control. That's where a violent temper comes from. Fourth, God hates... Okay, everybody ready? God hates the manipulative. God hates the manipulative. A heart that plots wicked schemes. What does someone that's manipulative, what is their goal? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to do? Control. Yeah, control for whose benefit usually? Their own, right? There's the heart, there's that selfish heart again. Remember, the opposite of love is selfishness. There's the selfish heart. Someone that manipulates, that, that maybe even doesn't have ill will toward another person or uh, someone else's outcome, but they just want to move all the chess pieces so that they always win. God hates that. God also hates an enthusiasm for sin. Now, maybe you're sitting there and going, okay, well, at least I'm not violent. I haven't shed any innocent blood lately. And I haven't, uh, and I don't have an enthusiasm for sin. Yay, sin. Wait, think about it. Is there any area in your life where you can't wait to be alone? Where you can't wait to be away from certain people so you can behave in a certain way, to partake of a certain thing, and you enthusiastically participate. Now, you might feel distress, remorse, shame, guilt after that, but before the sin happens, do you have an enthusiasm for it where your heart races, your blood pumps and you can't wait. God hates that. You know why? Because it's not only selfish, but typically when we have an enthusiasm for sin, that's going to separate you in the relationships that matter. Now, this also includes the looter during a protest that a protest is going on for a righteous cause and they see the mayhem and they just go, yeah, and they have no care about the cause, but they just start breaking things and looting. That includes that as well. But we have to beware the small secret sins, the looters of our hearts that separate us from God and become things that he hates. There's two more. Remember there's seven things? There's two more. One, the next one is that God hates the unjust. Why? Because he's just. The unjust. People who judge unjustly. Lastly, uh, the last thing that God hates is, okay, this one you should buckle down for, just like manipulative, you should buckle down for this one. God hates the quarrelsome. The quarrelsome. And what does quarreling look like? Does it look like a long, reasoned argument 
where emotions aren't involved? Does it look like a, a, a finely prepared debate document? No. Quarreling is rooted in selfishness. The scripture said, one who stirs up trouble among brothers. So this is not like arguing with people that you disagree with, uh, something that never happens in our lives, right? You're never on Facebook. Uh, no, quarrel, the quarrelsome person divides. It divides. That's why that phrase or that word brothers is used for when we divide amongst ourselves, the quarrelsome divide the communities that we work so hard to knit together that God wants knitted together. Relationships are destroyed when any or all of these things are present. That's why God hates them, because he's a God of relationship. He's a God of community. For relationships to work, for relationships to work, you must lead a confessional life. Okay, what does that mean? A confessional life is when you identify, where you self-identify yourself as a sinner. It's like your, I don't know how many people in the room are in recovery for alcohol or for drugs or for any other addiction, but in most 12-step programs, what is the first step? Oh, yeah, all my people in recovery. I thought that was going to be anonymous. Okay, I'll say it for you. The first step in recovery is admitting you have a problem. And so a confessional life starts with ha admitting you have a problem. Hi, I'm Michael, and I'm a sinner. Okay, all the people that normally go to meetings would say what? Oh, man, we got a lot of people in recovery. See, I just outed you. No, it's true. They say, hi, Michael. And you know why you say, hi, Michael? Because you want to acknowledge that I see you. I see you as a sinner. I'm sitting here. I'm ready to listen to you and not judge you. James 5.16. The book of James, we're studying the books of wisdom in the Old Testament. Here is a little Bible trivia because there's always some Bible trivia people in the room. A little nugget for you to take away is out of all the books in the New Testament, if you could fold one of those books into the books of wisdom of the Old Testament that we're studying all this summer, it would be the book of James. The book of James reads like a book of wisdom. It reads like the book of Proverbs in a lot of ways. But James 5.16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You see, we're really good in the church about talking about confession and living a confessional life, confessing your sins to God. Because 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So when we confess vertically to God, we gain forgiveness and confession. But James says when we confess to one another, leading a confessional life, we don't get forgiveness or cleansing. What do we get? We get healing. So when you live a confessional life, when, when these sins are present, these sins that God hates, when they're present in your life and you confess them to God, you get forgiveness and you get cleansing. But some of us are walking around like the walking wounded. We need healing. And so when we keep those sins to ourselves, when we don't admit what, that we were arrogant in our relationships, when, he, when we don't admit that we were quarrelsome, when we, when we don't admit that we had this thirst for sin, guess what? We don't experience healing. That's why it's important for all of us to see each other as sinners. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. It's like Oprah, except you don't get cars, you just get outed as a sinner. You're a sinner, you're a sinner. We're all sinners. And we should go nuts. Not because of the sin, because God hates the sin, but because of grace. Because God has provided a way for us to be right with him, in relationship with him, and with, in relationship with each other. Selfishness is the root of all sin. Of all sin. It's at the heart of all these sins that affect our relationships. So you want to be loving to your parents? 
You want to be loving to your brothers and sisters. You want to be loving to your spouse. You want to be loving to your coworkers, your neighbors. Become less selfish. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is not a prescription to do these seven things or not do these seven things and then you're going to be unselfish. Because you could say, well, I want better relationships. Why? For myself. So I'm happier. Oh, you're back to selfish. And then frankly, our sinful hearts are so sinful that we can't muster it up. Muster, it's a weird word. I'll use a different word. I'm talking to some of the young people over here. Muster, uh, conjure up. That's like Harry Potter. What am I doing? Do you get my meaning? You can't manufacture them. You can't create them on your own. You know what you need? You don't need a book, a seven-step book. What you need is Christ. Because the last point this morning is that Christ redeems everything. He makes everything whole, including our relationships. So what is needed? It's not, you know, have a new heart by Friday or have new relationships by in 40 days. No, what's needed is Jesus. You need Jesus to make your relationships right. Unless you want to break, you know, base it on kind of a transactional thing where, well, I'll tell you what, I'll treat you good if you treat me good. But as soon as you don't treat me good, then I'm not going to treat you good. That's conditional. That's transactional. And at its root, it's selfish. So here, I said it's not a seven-step formula, but I am going to identify the seven opposites of those sins that we just read about that God hates. I'm going to identify the opposites of those, and I'm going to identify them through the person of Christ and in his life. And so, first off, Christ was humble rather than the arrogance. Remember arrogance? So hum- humility is the opposite of arrogance rather than the arrogance of our hearts. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, it says, make your attitude that of Christ Jesus. That's a command to you all and to me. Make your attitude make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. That would be selfish, right? Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man and in external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Second, Jesus is the opposite of the things that God hates because he's truthful rather than those who live by deceitfulness. That's the opposite there. John 14, 6 says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus was truthful. Jesus was also, this is good news, Jesus was also life-giving instead of the violent matter of the heart of humanity. Jesus was life-giving. 1 John 5, 12 says, the one who has the Son has life. The one who doesn't have the Son of God does not have life. That's pretty plain and simple. Next, Jesus was considerate. This doesn't mean, oh, he remembers your birthday and sends you a special birthday blessing. Oh, it's so considerate. No, this is the fact that Jesus was grace-giving instead of being manipulative to achieve his goals. Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28 says this, it must not be like that among you. This is Jesus' words. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus was considerate. He wasn't manipulative. Next, Jesus was righteous. That's pretty obvious. He left behind, or he leaves us in the dust in his righteous wake for our appetite for evil. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered for sins once and for all. The righteous, that's him, for the unrighteous, that's us, that he might bring you to God after being put to death 
in the fleshly realm, realm, but made alive in the spiritual realm. Jesus was righteous, but Jesus was also just. Not like the unjustness of bearing a false witness. John 5, 30 says, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is righteous. There's those two together. Because I do not seek my own will, because that would be selfish, but the will of him who sent me. And lastly, Jesus was peacemaking. He was not quarrelsome. He is our peace. He tears down the dividing walls between us, or at least he should, and not just between us, but between all peoples. He's the ultimate uniter. He's not a divider. Ephesians 2.14 says this, for he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. Jews and Gentiles, all of mankind united. And all of this finds its culmination in his work on earth, leading a sinless, blameless life and put to death on a cross. And shortly before that, he gathered with his, with his disciples to celebrate his last supper with them. 